Hi, welcome to, to, to New Electromagnetism Applications Number 4. This video is the groundwork video for the Railgun project. The first objective is to do something fun to demonstrate the usefulness of a new electromagnetism. Obviously, this is going to generate more viewers and subscribers because it might be of a lot of interest to a lot of people. And they will either invalidate or validate the magnetic models. I really don't care which way this goes. If it validates them, that's great. If it invalidates them, that's awesome because that means I got more to learn, more to go. So I don't mind. Either way. So as a baseline, what I chose is just to take a look. Let's take a 9 millimeter projectile just to get a baseline of what the energies of a gun are. And then from there, we'll decide what we're going to do. Uh, if we look at the 9 millimeter parabellum, which is used by NATO forces today, it's got an 8 gram projectile, which is 124 grain at 360 meters per second muzzle velocity, 1,200 feet per second, which is about 521 joules or 384 foot pounds of energy at the muzzle. All right, but we don't want to go supersonic with this because that's a waste of energy. We want to make this very efficient. So we're going to keep it, whatever we do, we're going to keep it subsonic. And therefore, if we keep with an 8 gram projectile, at 300 meters per second, that's going to work out to 360 joules or 266 foot pounds. So just let's round it up, make a nice even 400 400 joules, and we'll adjust the the weight of the projectile to keep it subsonic. So we're looking for about 400 joules to, or about 300 foot pounds is what we're going to design to. Okay, let me make this clear. The design goal is 400 joules at the muzzle. But if we get a muzzle energy of 200 joules better, I'm going to assume that we're done. That's good enough, 50%. Okay. Now, the reason why is because for this margin is I've never built a railgun before, so I'm sure there's going to be a lot of learning curve, a lot of things learned. And if we don't make the 200 joules, well, there will be a Mark II, and we'll apply what was learned uh, in the Mark I to the Mark II. And the reason why I don't want to go all the way to a full, full up full up thing is I don't want this to become the focus of my website. I just want to prove that the models work and people can take this design wherever they want to go with it. Okay, I want to get on. There's a lot of other things I want to demonstrate, not just rail guns. So if we look at classic rail gun technology, and you can go to Wiki Railgun, what I'm showing you has been around for, for the ages. What you essentially have is two conductive rails let's say copper or something, fed at the end by a power supply, and then you have the armature or the projectile. And what happens is, by forcing current into this rail, it's going to short circuit against, uh, through the armature, and come back to this rail to the power supply, and that's the circuit that gets formed. And what, ha what generally happens is the rails generate the magnetic field that the armature reacts to. And so if we use classical theory, if the current's going this way, then from this rail, the, f the flux is coming up through the page at the armature. And since the current of this rail is going this way, it also generates magnetic field coming up at the armature. And since the current, if we use F equal QV cross B, since the current is going this way through the armature, but the magnetic field is coming up, and the force on the armature is this way, and that's why you get a force out. Okay, and this is the way you would compute it using new electromagnetism. This is a two-step process. This is a one-step process. Much easier. So if we take a look at the wiki answer, wiki went through this derivation, okay, and they used an approximation. When we der we're going to be deriving the same thing again in the next video. We're not going to do any approximation other than approximating uh, conductors as filamentary, which they do too. So what this approximation does, it assumes that at the point where the armature is, that the rails would, that have the current in it go off to infinity uh, for both rails. That's not, un, that's not too bad an approximation because when you actually look at the derivation, the effects of the rails actually, if the new, from the new electromagnetism, equations which tell you exactly how the rails affect it. The, the length of the rails do fall off pretty quickly with distance. So 
New electromagnetism tells you why. Their approximation isn't too bad. Uh, the other thing that makes it not very useful is you can't really compute you know, what, what's going to be the force at, of the armature at given distances down the rail because you're using infinite rails. It's going to be the same all along. So it doesn't matter that, that those are your rails. Whether your armature is here, here, or here, or here, or here, this, this equation will not tell you what the armature force is at different positions down the rail. The new electromagnetism derivation we'll do in the next video will. Okay. Um, and so these are the this is the equation they use. D is the distance between the rails. R is the thickness of the rail, or the radius of the rail. And you can see all, right off the bat that in order for this rail gun to be useful, you've got to put hundreds or thousands of amps through here. So you're not going to be using a very small rail. And the bigger your rail is, the smaller the force is. The size of the rails is inversely proportional to the force you get. So you've got two competing factors. You need current, which means you need a big rail to carry it, but you also would like to have small rails. And so you've got this, you know, conflicting design goals here. So let's just see what we have. Assume we have an 8-gram armature and just pick 100 amps. I just picked that pretty arbitrarily of current. How long must the rails be to get the projectile up to 300 meters per second, assuming that there's no friction at all? This is just a back-of-the-napkin calculation. Uh, we're going to use a, uh, a, a diameter of the rails of 2 millimeter and the diameter of, of the, the distance between the rails of 20 millimeters. When you do the calculations, you, it's about, you'll need 1.8 kilometer of rail. Okay, that's for 100 amps of current. So you can see why these railgun projects are very, very inefficient. Okay, but I mean, just to get a decent amount of force, you need like thousands of amps. I, I think some designs today are using millions of amps. So this is like ridiculous. And the other problem you get is because you got a million amps of current or lots of current going through these rails and the current in the rails are going in opposite direction. Well, according to new electromagnetism, opposing currents repel. So you got a lot of repulsing force on the rails. You got a lot of thermal energy going into the rails and, the, and that's one of the things if you go to the wiki page they say is the rails don't last too long. And that's one of the design problems that they're having. And this is pretty much what I just covered. Very large currents required in the mega amps. It's very destructive to the rails. Requires thick rails. Um, and the, one of the problems I see is they've got the rails and the projectile current or the armature current in series. And this increases the inductance and the dynamics of the load characteristics. And we'll cover that in more detail. This is a, the, the, a picture on Wikipedia. It's from the Navy test that they're doing. Okay, now I did not perform an exhaustive internet search. I'm not looking to beat the competition. I don't really know if what we're going to show as we design has already been out there or not. I'm just following the way new electromagnetism tells me the most efficient design is. Okay, so, but there was one thing that was also on the wiki page which is along the idea of where we're going to go with new electromagnetism, but we're going to do it better. Uh, there's a, th there was a railgun design captured after World War II and it shows, it's hard to see from the camera up there, that they're using magnets to source the magnetic field which means that they can reduce the current in the armature. The problem with this design is because now you have a ferric, a, a, a high permeable core, it's going to increase the inductance. It's going to make it very difficult for you to pump current into this at very high speeds. You're basically pumping it into a brick wall, an absorber, uh, sorry, an inductor. But that's where we're going, but we're going to do it differently so that we can mitigate the problems of the inductance of the rails. So how do we get rid of the inductance of the rails? Well, if we use the magnets, and we already I showed the magnets in the magnet table, we've got these magnets here that source 1440 amps, I'm sorry, 14,400 amps, or 15,000 amps on their edge currents. So instead of trying to source the magnetic field through the rails, what we can do is sort of just use the, the rails to source the current for the armature. Let the magnets handle the current for the field, current, the field for propulsion. And that way there we can feed the armature all the way along the length of the gun and don't have to run into this high inductance problem of trying to feed a loop and feed a loop. 
And that way we can get rid of the problem of the inductance of using a high permeable core. Well, not get rid of it, but just mitigate it tremendously. And also the other problem with the classic railgun design is only the rails behind the armature f source the field. When we're using a permanent magnet, the magnetic field present at the armature is from all four points of the compass here, not just the two behind. So we get a factor of a two improvement right off the bat. Okay, and then if if you look at this, we're going to be have a we're going to have magnets on the top and the bottom with the armature sandwiched in between. That's so don't be confused by this picture here. Okay, there's a second advantage to the new electromagnetism design. Okay, because even in the German design and the traditional design, you still have to source the armature current from the rails. Okay, that requires the rails to be thick in order to handle the current, and you're still, you know, this way here, we can actually make thinner rails because we're going to parallel feed the rails, and we get with a thinner rail, as you saw in the calculations we did before, the smaller the rail, the more efficient the design. This way here, we can have very, very thin rails because they're going to be end-fed, and therefore they're not going to be impeding on the magnetic field produced by the magnets. One of the problems with the pre previous designs and the German designs, you have to feed it from the end, which means that as the armature progresses down the rails, the size of the loop gets bigger, and if people that are familiar with classical theory know that as your size of your loop gets bigger, your inductance and your reactance increase as well. But because we're parallel feeding it, we're using the magnets to source the field, and we can source the armature any way we want, we can actually feed the gun from the front and thereby, as the armature goes down the magnet, we're actually reducing the size of the loop that the current has to go through. And so we're doing the opposite. We're decreasing the reactance as the armature gains speed. Okay, and then we could also reduce the reactance by feeding the rails at multiple locations. Okay, now don't be confused. This blue isn't connected to the orange or the yellow. It goes behind it. I just didn't, too lazy to draw it in such a way that shows that. So the blue is not connected to the orange. And also in the previous designs, you only get one power supply to feed the entire shot. And therefore, what happens typically, you charge up a capacitor and you dump it in here. Well, as the armature starts gaining speed, well, your capacitor starts going down in voltage. And so, you know, you've got opposing problems going on. With this design, you could feed a fresh power supply at every section. You can have a different power characteristic just like your car engine. When you start off, you start off in low gear, which gives you high torque but low velocity. Once you get the car moving, you go into second gear, which will change the power characteristic to give you pretty much a balance in your torque and your speed. And then once you get past that, then you, you switch your gear again to go to high speed, low torque, so you can travel efficiently at high speed. The same thing can be done here. You could have a power supply here that gets the armature going, which is low current I'm sorry, high current, low voltage, transitioning to the one on the end, when the, when the armature has its maximum speed, there's going to be a lot of back EMF. You're going to need a lot more voltage than current when you get to the end. This way you can match, more efficiently drive the gun than with needing a one power supply fits all solution here. Okay, there's lots of advantages to knowing the, to new electromagnet, the way it explains to you what's actually going on so you can optimize the design Okay, but now the, just to be clear here, the ideas presented on the previous pages are just conceptual based on my knowledge of new electromagnetism. The next phase is the proof of concept where we do actual computer modeling followed by experimental testing to determine if these concepts have merit before spending any time building anything. So the plan forward is to develop simple software modeling based on new electromagnetism uh, I'm actually call, I change it. I'm going to call it physics. Then we are going to obtain some neodymium magnets and quantify them using the new ma new magnetism current model. But that's already been done. There's already a video out on that. And then develop a simple tabletop experiment where a test armature is excited by a known current to see if the measured force agrees with the prediction of the software. Once everything agrees, we can use the software to model different configurations to evolve a design, and then we build. Thank you very much.